Welcome back, folks. It is Wednesday, and we are continuing our Industrial Revolution notes. Uh, hopefully, y'all used yesterday to get caught up on anything you had missing, get folders cleaned up, whatever you were productive uh, on Tuesday while we had the PSAT testing. Um, let's continue. Let's talk about um, some differences, okay? Uh, Texas is different from Oklahoma, is different from New York, New York State, is different from Oregon, right? Everything is different, north and south particularly. So really, we're going to talk about some economic differences. We're going to talk about the north, the south, and the west as we develop westward. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me get my clicker going here. Uh, one of the things that we improved on, uh, it should be on the back of your notes. Uh, there's a chart there that will get you filled out here in just a minute. So if you go ahead and go to the back. It says innovations and improvements. We're going to talk about the National Road, the Erie Canal. We're going to talk about the steamboat, trains and railroads, telegraph, interchangeable parts, which really revolutionized the system. We're going to talk about um, the cotton gin. We're going to talk about what else? The farm tools, the reaper, and the plow, and the power loom, and the steam engine, and the Bessemer steel process, which is how we could afford to cheaply and quickly build all these steel things, the railroads, the railroad cars, right? The plows, the Bessemer steel process is really important to this whole, whole system, all right? And the factory system that gave us uh, the, the ability to build all these things the way we did, all right? Uh, let's talk about the National Road real quick. So it was built in the 1800s. It is a federally funded highway that goes through the Appalachian Mountains. It connects Illinois all the way to uh, basically Virginia, Pennsylvania, right where they connect at the Potomac. Um, it's a big deal. It, it encourages transportation or it lowers the cost of transportation. It very much speeds up transportation. It's a smooth surface um, well maintained and and easy to get through okay uh, that's a big deal right the cheaper we can ship goods the cheaper we can sell it for you also have the erie canal uh, the old erie canal we talked about it before it is a major thoroughfare for goods uh, they used mule teams actually to pull barges through it through the locks uh, that raised and lowered the the ships as the ground goes up and down uh, it's a waterway. It connects all the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean through the Hudson River. Uh, it runs through upstate New York. You can see it right there. Um, check it out. It's a pretty cool thing. I mean, it was a big, huge, expensive project, but the payoff in the end was huge because now all these massive amounts of products, grains, and stuff like that built in the are grown in the in the Midwest, the mining stuff coming out of the north, uh, all of that can be quickly loaded on huge barges and shipped from one side of the country to the next and internationally even. Okay, uh, quick, cheap, all good things when you're talking about um, production. Uh, the steamboat, right? Well, we can float down the river, but how do you get back up it? Well, here comes the steamboat. Okay, it used a steam engine. Uh, it's no longer, we're no longer dependent on the wind to blow us across the ocean, on the river to take us one way. Uh, we're not rowing the boat, right? It's not manpower. We're using steam to turn the big paddle wheels and to move ships anywhere we would like to go. Okay, the steam engine, it's, it's pretty straightforward, honestly. If you've ever seen one in real life, uh, it's a piston. You put steam in it and it pushes it and it goes round and round and round. And with that power, you can produce movement. Uh, that's the beauty of the steam engine. This is the guy that made it. Um, we'll talk about him more in a later project here. But this is a major improvement. So not only can you ship goods down the Mississippi, right, with the current, those same ships can go right back up, bringing other goods up, bringing people up. Uh, it, it just simplifies the process. Uh, used to, in the, in the old days, they would build a boat, float it down the river, and then destroy the boat because you can't take it back, right? Um, every trip you had to build a new boat. In fact, one of our presidents, Abraham Lincoln, 
Uh, he made several trips down the Mississippi from his family farm to sell his goods in the lower states, New Orleans, in fact. So he built a boat, took the treacherous river crossing all the way down New Orleans, and then walked back to his home in Illinois and Kentucky. Uh, right, that was the process. See how much it's expense that would be, the time involved? Well, now the steamboat fixes that. Now we're talking about some serious stuff here, some serious firepower, so to speak, when we talk about trains, all right? They use steam power as well uh, to power the locomotive, which could pull tons of goods and people anywhere you wanted to go, anywhere you were willing to lay the track, okay? Uh, the Northeast is just crisscrossed with railroad tracks. If you ever go up there, you will see, especially as you go by plane, the just plethora of railroad tracks that are up there. Now, as you go south and continue southwest, that really slows down. But eventually, we're going to have the Transcontinental Railroad uh, that connects the continent all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we're actually going to have several routes eventually that do that. Um, the picture there is 1870, so this is after the Civil War. Uh, it's continuing to grow. Uh, even today, they're still building some new lines and using trains as a cheap, efficient way to move tons of material from one place to the other. Uh, the telegraph. Okay, the telegraph is, it's interesting, if I can get this thing to work. Uh, it's interesting in what it can do, right? It is instantaneous communication. Uh, it's a series of dots and dashes, which is Morse code. There's Mr. Morse right there who invented it. Uh, that spells out what you want to say. Uh, the signals travel via wire. So you, like the power cables we see today, they had telegraph tables back in, oh, excuse me, the Industrial Revolution. Um, this sped up communication. Okay, you could send a message home, hey, things are good, come see me. Or or you could send a message, hey, you know, we need help here. There's an Indian raid or or the Buffalo Herd is here, let's go get it. Right. Whatever you need to say, you could send it across vast different distances uh, and quickly, almost immediately get a response. Um, if you ever heard the term SOS, right, the, the International Signal for Chip in Distress, um, like help, right? That is Morse code, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 S-O-S. Um, people, this, this is, a, this is a, an interesting language. Uh, the telegraph operators um, learned, were so good at listening and feeling as they tapped out uh, this message on the machine. They were amazing at transcribing messages. Uh, it was really an art form. Uh, it kind of reminds me a lot of like American Sign Language, like the 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 motions and signals right the signs uh, it's kind of the same thing with Morse code you, you learn the individual letters or the individual words right uh, very interesting um, very useful as far as communication and control uh, the government could could send messages to its representatives from DC all the way to the Western territories eventually all the way to California and really you could maintain a unity as a nation through communication. Um, interchangeable parts. This is sometimes just kind of gets people what this is, it's it's that's a picture of what's gonna be a gun eventually. But really it's parts, it's tools, it's devices, they're made identically. Every single piece is the same, right? One pin is the same as the next pin is the same as the next pin. Uh here's my pencil, right? My mechanical pencil. Uh, I bought a box of two, so there's two that are the same. There were 10 boxes on the shelf, so there's 20 that are the same, right? And there's probably 2 million that they built. Um, it's each individual part. Not only uh, is it beautiful in that you can quickly produce items, but you can quickly replace parts that break. Uh, it's no longer you built one and if you break it, you got to buy a new one or build a, new, a whole new one. Uh, you know, you break the trigger on the gun, you take it off and put in a new trigger, and it's going to fit because every piece for those guns were built the same, okay? Uh, we're not talking about just guns. We're talking about farm implements. We're talking about furniture. We're talking about every single thing that can be mass-produced piece by piece uh, takes advantage of the idea of interchangeable parts. Uh, this also drives down cost because 
it takes away some of the skill required to make things like weapons. Uh, now, one person might make the trigger, one person might make the stock, one person might make the barrel, but he makes them all the same. Okay, it doesn't take one person to learn how to make all three of those parts. One person makes one part. The cotton gin. This is this is an amazing invention as well as one of the most controversial that we will talk about. Uh, the cotton gin separated the seed that is found in the cotton bowl from the actual fibers, the puffy fibers. Uh, if you've never seen cotton, like actually cotton in the field, uh, look at a cotton ball. Your mom probably has a cotton ball at the house. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's very similar to what it looks like in the field. Um, the cotton gin, what you used to, you, you used to literally pull apart the fibers and pick out these little seeds, and it's painstakingly slow, and your fingers would ache, and it was just a slow process. Uh, that's the, the reason slavery really took off in the South with cotton was because of how many people it took to process it. Well, Eli Whitley comes along and says, hey, we're going to use the cotton gin. He, he creates a system where you turn a wheel and it grabs the fibers and it pulls the fibers through uh, a screen and it, it separates the seeds out and it kicks out the clean cotton and it kicks out the seeds on the other end and it makes the process fast. His idea, his thinking, his reasoning behind it, we can reduce the amount of labor needed to produce cotton, right? He was looking at a way to reduce and eliminate slavery. What happened was now plantation owners could process more cotton, so they planted more cotton. Um, it did not, in fact, reduce demand for slavery. It actually increased it as they continued to grow bigger and bigger plantations because they could process more and more cotton thanks to the cotton gin. Uh, that's what we call the law of unintended consequences. Uh, that's really unintended consequences. Look that up. Do a little research and see what you think that, figure out what that means. Uh, but, you know, the best of intentions sometimes go awry with these inventions. Farm tools. Farming is hard, right? The ground is hard. Well, now we have plows and reapers uh, that plant the wheat, that plant the cotton, that plant everything. We have the plows that breaks the ground for us. Instead of doing it by hand like they used to, now you have a plow pulled behind a horse. Uh, it's still hard work. I've actually done that myself. Um, plowed a little bit of a field behind a horse. It is terribly hard work, but it's 10 times as fast as doing it with a shovel. Um, and, and half the work, right? So it is a vastly improved system when you're talking about the steel plow, breaking up the ground, the hard ground in some cases, uh, that really no one else could have done by hand in any sort of amount of time. Um, we have harvesters. We call them combines now, but that's basically what that picture in the middle is. Uh, it breaks off the wheat and collects it and gathers it so it can be processed faster and faster. Um, you can thank John Deere. John Deere for his inventions in the farm system. Okay, John Deere is still around. Uh, eventually, we'll go from this nice little harvester to this nice little harvester, both produced by John Deere. Uh, the power loom. You know all that cotton we're making? Well, guess what? It's got to be processed somehow, and that's where the power loom comes in. Uh, the power loom takes the process of making cloth out of the home, out of the individual person's hands, and puts it onto machines. So it takes the cotton, it strings it. Take hang on one second. Minute, please. Sorry about that. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, the power loom, it, it, take, it creates cloth, or it creates thread, which then weaves it together into cloth, and you have the materials that we make shirts out of, right? Uh, this used to be done by hand. Now it's done by machine, and by machine, quickly. I'm talking thousands of yards of fabric created as opposed to inches a day, okay? It really speeds up the process. It drives down the cost of cloth so they can be manufactured quickly, cheaply, and sold to everybody. Uh, then you have, instant, like, think about this. If, if you only had, like, a few yards of cloth, it was probably gray or white, or black, something 
boring, so to speak. Uh, well, now you're making thousands of yards. You have time to dye it, to make it pretty colors, to make pretty designs, all this new stuff, right? These machines allow that to happen. Uh, the power loom is pretty cool. Uh, it's really the rise of the factories in, in the Northeast in particular. All right, the Bessemer steel process. Now, it's a process, right? It's not an actual like invention itself. It's an innovation. Uh, and what it is, it's a way to make steel. You take iron, you melt it down, you purify it, and you kick out steel. Uh, and not only that, it's a cheap way to do it and a mass-produced way to do it. We already have a All right, last interruption, then I got to wrap this up. Uh, the Bessemer steel process, it created cheap ways to create steel, okay? And that steel was used in railroads and railroad trestles and building factories and building railroads themselves, the steel plow, the reaper, interchangeable parts, the power loom, the steam engines that powered the steamboat, uh, the steam shovels that dug the Erie canals. Listen, guys, the Bessemer steel process might be one of the most important things on the list. All right. Uh, this is kind of a short, kind of a quick introduction to that. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up for today. There's an assignment in today's module. Make sure you get that started and get that going because it'll be due tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we'll finish the notes. We'll go through the impact on the environment and production and prices and all that kind of good stuff. And then we'll work a few assignments and we'll get a quiz going next week and we'll call it a day on the industrial, excuse me, on the industrial revolution. Uh, Y'all have a great day and I will see you tomorrow.